Buongiorno, welcome to our conversation on uh, Paradiso 15. My name is Jelena Todorovic. I am Associate Professor of Italian in the Department of French and Italian at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I'm here with my very good colleague, uh, Ernesto. Hello, uh, my name is Ernesto Liborni. As Jelena said, we are colleagues in the Department of French and Italian uh, here at uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, as promised, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, Paradiso uh, 15, uh, which is uh, one of the several county uh, in, that cover the sphere uh, of Mars, the sphere of courageous souls, um, and uh, which begins roughly uh, in the last third of uh, Canto 14, continues in Canti um, uh, 15, 16, 17, and uh, occupies also the first part, some 60 verses of Canto 18. Yeah, in fact, Yelena, you are already pointing out a, uh, a very important characteristic of the encounter Dante has with Cacciaguida, who is the soul Dante encounters in Paradiso 15, because this encounter lasts three cantos. Uh, 15, 16, and 17 um, are uh, uh, three, uh, three consecutive cantos in which Dante is in uh, dialogue with uh, uh, Cacciaguida. And in fact, uh, we don't know this at the end of uh, Paradiso 14, but really Cacciaguida uh, appears already at the end of uh, uh, Paradiso 14 when Dante is uh, enjoying the vision of the cross. And Cacciaguida is, is a soul, as we see at the beginning of Paradiso 15, is a soul that moves from the cross in this peculiar way. You know, he moves away from the cross, but at the same time, he's still part of the cross as he approaches Dante in the first uh, nine tercine of Paradiso 15. Uh, and then he stays with Dante uh, certainly all the way to Paradiso 17. But in Dante's mind, Cacciaguida is still present at the beginning of Paradiso 18, as Cacciaguida, as Dante is reflecting on uh, Cacciaguida's prophecy on uh, Dante's own uh, fame. So th this is a very, very uh, important and pervasive uh, presence, at least uh, in these uh, central cantos of uh, uh, Paradiso. Right, and uh, as everybody knows, uh, Cacciaguida will have that, the honor uh, of um, the said honor uh, of um, uh, really putting all the pieces uh, of the uh, puzzle of prophecy of Dante's exile yeah. and Dante's future. Uh, in uh, Canto 17, we're not going to talk about it. We're leaving that to the colleagues who are discussing Canto 17. But these are the moments in 15 when that conversation starts to take shape and starts to take us into uh, certain directions uh, that will be important, right? Mm -hmm. Especially uh, the conversation uh, about Florence. Uh, its past yeah. and its presence, present, uh, and uh, of course, the, in the first part of Canto, um, uh, these fathers uh, and sons um, yeah. uh, from the yeah, present yeah, and yeah. from the past uh, finding the each other. The parental lineage. Right. Uh, that on which Cacciaguida and Dante uh, insist in, uh, with, with a beautiful language full of uh, important metaphors. Uh, in fact, the canto may be divided into certainly two parts besides the first uh, 27 lines, the first nine terzine. Then uh, uh, Cacciaguida, since line 28, starts addressing Dante and they have a conversation all the way to line 90, uh, in which Cacciaguida and Dante, um, uh, uh, well, Cacciaguida knows already that Dante is his descendant, uh, in fact, shares with Dante his knowledge. Now, he knew that uh, one of his descendants, while still living, would, uh, would go and visit uh, him um, and uh, uh, Paradise. And Cacciaguida starts also 
uh, presenting the, 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 the parental uh, metaphors uh, that he elaborates with Dante. Whereas in the second part of the canto, from line 91 all the way to the end, to line 148, uh, Cacciaguida and Dante lay out the uh, topics of conversation that they will elaborate uh, in Canto uh, 16 and Canto 17, respectively. That is uh, the corruption uh, in Florence at the present time, that is uh, at the time of uh, Dante, uh, in contrast to uh, the, uh, the, the, the splendor of uh, the times in which Cacciaguida lived in Florence, um, and, uh, uh, and then in Canto 17, uh, the, the Cacciaguida's prophecy uh, uh, regarding Dante's own uh, fame. And uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Uh, I was maybe going to suggest we read a couple of uh, terzine yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah. then... Uh, um, in fact, uh, I would like to start with uh, uh, two terzine, one in which Dante elaborates uh, the gem metaphor uh, through a cluster of metaphors, and the following terzina in which Cacciaguida uh, elaborates uh, his own arboreal uh, metaphor, again, with a, with a a, a, a cluster, if I uh, may call it so, a cluster of metaphors uh, uh, as uh, the, the arboreal metaphor is elaborated in uh, very few lines. So uh, perhaps, Elena, I will read lines 85, 90, and if you don't mind, you can read uh, the English translation. Sure. Thank you. Um, Ben supplico io a te, vivo Topazio, che questa gioia preziosa in gemmi perché mi facci del tuo nome sazio. O fronda mia, in che io compiacemmi pur aspettando, io fui la tua radice, co tal principio rispondendo femmi. Indeed, I do beseech you, living Topaz, set in this precious jewel as a gem. Fulfill my longing, let me know your name. O oh, you, my branch, in whom I took delight even awaiting you, I am your root. So he, in his reply to me, began. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, Dante uh, really insists on the gem metaphor, right? You know, vivo topazio, questa gioia preziosa, in gemmi. Um, and... Uh, this gem metaphor had already been introduced by uh, um, Cacciaguida uh, himself uh, in, uh, in previous uh, uh, lines in the, in, the, in the first part of the, in the first um, uh, terzine of the, uh, of the canto. And um, on the other hand, Cacciaguida, in his words, uh, uh, elaborates on the arboreal metaphor of Ronda Mia, la tua radice, therefore preparing the ground for uh, uh, his uh, uh, references to the genealogical tree, uh, basically, to the father-son relationship. And this genealogical tree, um, this uh, translatum that uh, now from the metaphor moves uh, to the very uh, existential relationship that is the runs between Cacciaguida and Dante, you know, the generations that run between Cacciaguida and Dante. Granted, the, the, the genealogical tree precedes Cacciaguida and will uh, uh, follow after Dante with Dante's children uh, and the other uh, descendants. But uh, here, Cacciaguida is focusing on uh, this arboreal metaphor in order to stress the uh, a, a father-son relationship, as you were saying earlier, and the blood lineage between Cacciaguida and uh, uh, Dante. And also, uh, Dante introduces, in the first uh, uh, terzine, introduces, uh, prepares us for uh, Cacciaguida's arrival through the mention of l'ombra d'Anchise, that is, uh, Anchise's uh, uh, shade uh, and, his, and the surprise of Anchises, father of Aeneas, 
when he sees Aeneas in the netherworld, and uh, here Dante is referring to the sixth book of the Aeneid, in particular to lines 684, 686, when in fact Anchises, the father, meet with dead now, meets the son Aeneas, who is uh, uh, visiting him. And, in, and with, with reference to this uh, specific passage in uh, episode in the Aeneid, uh, Dante is allowing Virgil to still be present. Virgil uh, left Dante, you know, he uh, fulfilled his task of being Dante's guide at the end of uh, Purgatorio 30 when uh, he was uh, replaced by uh, Beatrice. And yet Dante, with this reference, uh, inserts uh, his homage to uh, Virgil uh, one more time. Another father figure. <laughs> Another Always father figure. Present. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. The, the, the literary father figure, uh, one of the literary father figures, Virgil, certainly uh, a very important uh, figure for, uh, uh, for Dante. And instead, the arboreal metaphor that uh, uh, Cacciaguida elaborates prepares us for uh, further references that both Cacciaguida and Dante will make to their parental connection, so that later on, Cacciaguida will call uh, Dante figlio in line 52, and uh, Dante will reply uh, by referring to the paterna festa, no? uh, therefore addressing Cacciaguida as a father, as an ancestor, no? and this happens in line uh, 84. <laughs> And this this can be a good springboard into the uh, maybe a brief analysis of the second part of the canto, mm -hmm. right? How these uh, father son relate, how this father son relationship and generally uh, familial uh, connections, how that ties in the uh, really, as you said earlier, rightly so. Uh, this harsh criticism of Florence, how um, uh, Florentine people have allowed the this most sacred connection in the society between fathers and sons and fathers and daughters and generally within the family to deteriorate because of uh, the subiti guadagni, if you will, right, of the gente nova uh, from uh, uh, Inferno, well, not only Inferno 16, but really starting this criticism of Florence and of the new economical and political system, especially economical side of it, uh, that uh, first comes up with um, uh, Chaco's um, uh, remarks in Inferno 6 and then continues uh, throughout the Commedia and doesn't really even stop here. Um, so I'm going to read uh, several terzine uh, from uh, 97 to 106. And uh, and as I thank you in advance for reading the uh, translation, uh, always in uh, Mandelbaum's translation. Fiorenza dentro della cerchia antica, ondella toglie ancora e terza e nona si stava in pace, sobria e pudica. Non avea catenella, non corona, non gonne contigiate, non cintura che fosse a veder più che la persona. Non faceva nascendo ancora paura la figlia al padre, che al tempo e la dote non fuggì in quinci e quindi la misura. Non avea case di famiglia vote. And I'll stop here. Florence, within her ancient ring of walls, that ring from which she still draws fierce and nuns, sober and chaste, lived in tranquility. No necklace and no coronal were there, and no embroidered gowns. There was no girdle that caught the eye more than the one who wore it. No daughter's birth brought fear unto her father, for age and dowry then did not imbalance to this side and to that the proper measure. There were no families that bore no children. 
Thank you, Ernesto. And there is so much to unpack here. We only have a couple of minutes. Uh, so uh, I will concentrate on the measure, right? One of the last uh, words that you uh, that you read here, measure that has been lost, the misura, the Aristotelian golden mean that has been lost in this new um, society uh, where um, uh, the, the economy is based on usury. Uh, it is based on uh, quick, uh, fast, earnings uh, that ne by necessity leads to excess. And this is the excess that Dante has uh, really condemned from the very beginning, right, of, uh, in uh, the image of the, the lupa uh, of the first canto of the Inferno, uh, and going all the way into at least the uh, Paradiso 27 when uh, St. Peter condemns uh, the popes in the excess, uh, right, in his seat uh, in um, uh, the papal throne. Um, so it is very um, clear, and Dante has been uh, accused about uh, being too reactionary, especially when it comes to these verses that we have just read, uh, almost of uh, uh, inviting to make Florence great again. But I think that uh, uh, here it is important to note that he's uh, in offering negative examples from the present, which all go back to that um, to the fast earnings and to the uh, uh, morals that have been lost because of uh, constantly chasing money and profit, he is offering a negative example of the present, right? In the Terzina, the Terzina that we read are part of a list of a series of four Terzina begin uh, that begin anaphorically with adverb non, right? So in the good old times, you didn't have people who uh, were uh, concentrating on the outside, on the ephemeral, uh, who were not necessarily thinking about themselves, uh, right, as, as human beings uh, and who they really are, their morals, their families. Um, yeah, and, and, and he also inserts this uh, uh, reference, uh, again, to the daughter in relation to the father, how the father did not need to fear. In those days, the father did not need to fear the daughter because the daughter would uh, uh, grow up being a respectful uh, one. And uh, with, you know, in the context of the dowry, in the context of the marriage, they would be uh, uh, prepared for, uh, for her. Exactly. And he would not have, uh, he makes a reference to tempo e la dote, uh, uh, right? The father would not have to be afraid of losing the daughter too early because in Dante's days, women or girls were promised in marriage uh, at a very young age. And the dowries were exorbitant, uh, as Buti noticed uh, in his commentary on this passage, uh, that those dowries that were given in Dante's time could only be obtained through usury, theft, and other nefarious activities. So this is, again, a direct strike, uh, right? Um, a direct blow to uh, the current um, uh, economic uh, uh, status uh, of, of Florence and of its citizens. Um, and these negative examples, uh, very briefly, are followed by a series of images of a paradise lost, right? Once upon a time, Cacciaguida says in his, uh, when he was growing up, um, uh, several generations were living in one house, uh, and he really presents women as cornerstone of the society, the grandmother that spins, the mother who watches uh, her son or daughter in a cradle, um, and that child uh, growing up in very modest, uh, but virtuous society and atmosphere. Uh, all of that uh, is really being lost in Dante's time and he cannot but uh, not only condemn it, but also uh, try to offer some uh, examples of what it could be. Um, and I think this is the key uh, uh, for, uh, for reading uh, these, um, uh, these lines and this criticism. Um, so very quickly, uh, before uh, we say our goodbyes, um, I just wanted to uh, tie what we were uh, saying into 
the last part of the canto where Cacciaguida finally reveals uh, his name uh, and uh, states that he too was um, baptized uh, in the uh, baptistry of San Giovanni uh, and that eventually dies in a crusade as a Christian martyr. Um, again, another example of a virtuous individual uh, that stands in stark, stark contrast to um, individuals uh, of Dante his time uh, in Florence. Um, sorry, did you want to add anything? No, that's uh, that, that's that's good. Uh, considering the time available to us. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, Ernesto, very much thank for you, this yeah, chat. Yeah. This, and uh, we're thank you, course, everyone. Yes, thankful to everybody watching and to Alison Cornish uh, for uh, giving us this platform to chat about Dante in the year of Dante. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.